As a finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. and awesome good evening our professional colleagues friends of the institute of chartered accountant of nigeria our students ladies and gentlemen let me start the first show of the year 2023 by giving you a good compliment saying compliment of the season and welcome to the new year year 2023 that we all be aspiring to enter. We all made it. And I want to use this opportunity once again to appreciate all our viewers that were connected with us in the year 2022. I'm sure you add one or two things to gain from all the topics that we'll add with you in the year 2022. We are here again in 2023, ready to move and raise the bar discussing issues that are contemporary and impacting us deeper in the things that we need to know. And I want to encourage you to make it a point of call every Tuesday and Thursday between the hours of 6 and 7 to enrich your knowledge and tap more of this. Today, I've come with a topic that is very key, strategic, to start the year so that we can have effective planning, and that is the analysis of the 2023 budget and the Finance Act 2022. You and I understand that this act was put together December 21st, 2022, and in our usual tradition, we'll make it a point of contact to discuss it so that we can have an in-depth of it. And to do justice to this is a friend of the house, a brother, uh, the man I regard to professor of professors, no other person than Taiwo Oyedele, FCA, I need not to bore you with uh, the uh, CV of uh, Mr. Taiwo Yedele. Uh, he's the partner of fiscal policy and African tax leader, PricewaterhouseCooper, PWC. And uh, he is an author of keynote speaker, strategic policy analyst, and commentator on finance, business, and economic matter. Uh, he's a regular guest on various media channels including major TV stations online and the uh, terrestrial world. Uh, for, for those of us who are connected, uh, I heard his voice this afternoon when he was doing justice on one of the uh, TV stations. Uh, a member of the Global Tax Forum and the former member of the Global Governing Council of ACCA and alumnus of the Lagos Business School of Economics, uh, Yale University and Harvard Kennedy School of Executive Education. Uh, a guest lecturer at the Lagos Business School and the founder and president of the Impact Africa Foundation. 
That is my guest today. But before I bring in my guest, let me reiterate, we're starting the, the, the new year, and I want to encourage you, bring your goods and services on this global acclaimed, you know, uh, program where we have our members connected, uh, you know, both within the country and actually the shore of uh, Nigeria, where we can promote your goods and services at a very minimal cost. And I can tell you, you patronize, you do that for us, just like we have with SEMA, you have a global space of which your goods and services will definitely be welcome. Let me quickly go on a very short break. And when I'll be coming in, uh, I will come in with our guest as we do justice to the topic of today. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. Welcome and good evening, uh, the man I always regard as Professor. Good evening. How are you doing? Taiwo, oh yeah, daily. Tell us that you are not your professor. Compliment of the season and happy new year. Thank you. I wish you the same and compliment of the season to our audience. Yeah. So we fire on the very great uh, cylinder as all our guests are well prepared to hear from the orator the oracle himself dishing out to us the analysis of the 2023 budget and the finance act 2022 and prof i'm starting this way what mm -hmm. is your take on the 2023 budget and the budgeting process yeah thank you very much maybe i should start with the um <clears throat> the budgeting process uh on one hand i'll say it's good that these governments uh, over the past three to four years uh, have consistently produced the budget at the beginning of the year, which is good to align with the fiscal January to December calendar year. Um, we've seen a bit more uh, transparency in terms of what government is putting out there. So even when you don't agree, at least you have the information to say you hereby disagree, particularly at the federal level. Uh, we also have seen an attempt to introduce zero-based budgeting, and I'm sure for accountants, they fully understand that. But, you know, in case we have non-accountants uh, attending this program, it's really about saying every single year, uh, every government agency, ministry, and department have to justify every naira they want to spend. It's not enough to say last year you gave us 10 naira. 
So this year, can you give us 11 error or 12? So, but in terms of the implementation, we, you know, have a few questions as to whether indeed uh, we are really implementing zero-based budgeting, budgeting as it should be. I also think that also <clears throat> some MDAs uh, are not able to provide sufficient explanation that is compelling enough uh, for their budgets. And it will seem like the lawmakers are sometimes more interested in, you know, just get this out of the way. Let's tick another box to say we get it out by 1st of January, sometimes even prioritizing that over the diligence that is required. Uh, I'm also still concerned that despite the president complaining last year that the lawmakers introduced all manners of new projects, sometimes they reduce a very important project, they reduce the amount and go and put it in their own constituency project. <laughs> <laughs> they have done that again this year. I think about yeah. 770 billion have been billion. introduced different, uh, you know, uh, project. The lawmakers need to realize and understand that their role is not to do project. Their, look, their role is to do, to make laws and provide oversight. So I think that we need to find a way to roll back this, our very convoluted democracy where, you know, I think part of it is also due to the public, you know, even the people, when you go and campaign as a lawmaker wanting to go for another term, they're asking you for role, they're asking you for schools. <laughs> um, I think beyond the process, my overall impression of the budget is that um, it's a budget that I was not expecting to see in my lifetime, in the sense that the deficit in the original budget that the president submitted to the National Assembly was even more than the revenue, uh, about mm. 10 point something trillion. The lawmakers yeah, 10 .7 added. Eight. Yes, so the lawmakers have added even more to that deficit uh, <laughs> by adding additional 1.3 trillion to the size of the budget. We also need to bear in mind that just a few days to the end of last year, uh, they also passed the supplementary budget for 2022, mm -hmm. which the president also signed today along with the 2023 appropriation bill into an act. So if you combine the almost 1 trillion supplementary budget with additional 1.3 trillion in extra spending that the lawmakers have added, you are easily looking at close to about 12 to 13 trillion of budget deficits for 2023. Deficit. And, yeah. and over the past few years, uh, if you look at government performance in terms of their revenue targets versus the actual revenue, they have consistently underperformed. So, which means if government underperforms again this year on revenue, that deficit will even grow bigger. Mm -hmm. And the bigger it grows, the more government will borrow, the more the cost of servicing the debt to revenue ratio will go up. Um, and we just have to try and make a turn from this trend. It's not sustainable and it shouldn't continue for, for too long. Mm -hmm. At the state level, because sometimes we don't pay attention to the states, you know, just putting their budgets together here and there, you know, we don't have the numbers for all of them. As of 2022, their budget deficit was about 5 trillion naira uh, for a budget size of around 10 trillion. We expect that 2023 will be very similar to 2022. Mm -hmm. When indeed the amount of money they made from IGR, internally generated revenue, and FAC was under 5 trillion. So if you add the de deficits, at the federal level to the deficit at the state level, you are easily looking at about 16 to 17 trillion of budget deficit for Nigeria. We don't know what the local governments are doing, so we, we can't even <laughs> estimate their own budget deficit. But I can imagine that they, you know, some people say that local government is sharing committees, they just collect money and share it away. Yeah, and share it. Anyway, so that would be my overall take on, on the budget and the process. Oh, very brilliant one. Uh, from our guest, uh, Professor Taiwo Oyedele, uh, discussing, telling us the budgeting uh, process, and he has given his insight, at least some kudos to the government talking about uh, transparency, the implementation of the zero budgeting, and uh, also an overview of uh, the 2023 uh, budget. Uh, let me, uh, before I proceed, said this evening we try as much as possible to make it very interactive. I know a lot of us have questions for Prof. 
and your uh, prof is fully prepared to do justice uh, to uh, every of our queries and questions today. So right from now, push in your question and let me just push it straight uh, to prof. Uh, prof, you've spoken about uh, the supplementary budget, uh, which is uh, quite alarming, which the president signed concurrently with the uh, 2023 budget. I, I want to give, I want you to give our audience more insight uh, because there is something we are missing: state budget. It seems it's only federal government that is uh, ruling us. State are just out there. We just have state governor. Uh, what is your stake? Uh, when we talk about state budget, can you give us an insight into some of these things, sir? Yes, yes. Let me even start with the supplementary budget that you, that you mentioned. So um, I, I think for the sake of proper understanding, so when you make a budget, which is just a plan of what you want to spend and where you want to get the money from, and next to the constitution, the budget is the second most important document for any country hmm. because it shows your priority of spending. Uh, it shows how you want to raise your revenue and it shows what's important to, to the government and by extension, the people. Because they are projections, they normally will be based on assumptions and assumptions are not cast in stone. You may expect that you know inflation will go to you know 15 percent and it may exceed that it may not be up to that you may say price of oil will be 20 dollars it may end up being 10 it may end up being 40. so as those things evolve and you have clarity or sometimes things that you haven't planned for like emergencies you can then do an additional budget and then we call it a supplementary budget they are normally that I have seen within the uh, system in Nigeria over the past few years is that government, instead of being supplementary budget, especially federal government, they have come up with what they call revised budget. So there's no such thing as a revised budget in the constitution. So at least it's good now that government is moving back to supplementary, mm. which is what we have in the law. Uh, and therefore, they are saying we need to spend additional money. When you interrogate this additional money that government wants to spend, you know, about 900 billion, they are saying because of the emergency around the flood and flood. everything. And, and I keep saying to myself, in the 2022 original budget, <laughs> we had huge amounts of provision for humanitarian services. We have mm. for contingencies. So nobody has even explained how those monies have been spent. Mm. The flood happened, people struggle, some of them are still struggling now, some of them have moved on with their lives, trying to struggle, and then this is the time we are now just putting the budget together before you award the contract, before you get it done, it will be somewhere around May or June next year. So I personally think that that supplementary budget was uncalled for. Mm. I think that whatever we really need to spend that we haven't provided for in 2022, given that we had only a few days to the end of the year, could have been added to the budget for 2023. 23. Mm -hmm. Instead of extending 2022 budget by another three months, you just commence a new budget in 2023 and you implement it diligently. So that is one issue that I have seen in terms of the supplementary. Now, to your second part, second part of your question on the states. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we everything that we do uh, is influenced by the locality and the environment in which we find ourselves. Mm. So, and to a large extent, in fact, for many of our people, including small businesses, households, individuals, they are often more affected by local issues than what's happening at the federal government level. So what that means is we need to start paying attention to the state budget. And I'm hoping that one day we have, uh, you know, the kind of leadership that will put the pressure on local government to also publish their accounts, publish their budget. I want to be able to see the budget for my local government, but I can't find it. So at the state <laughs> level, you, uh, yeah, at the state level, you find, you know, many of the... Um, states uh, houses of assemblies uh they don't even pay attention to the budget i don't even think they scrutinize enough they just sign whatever is presented to them 
And that's yeah, yeah, it. You know, one one very funny example is, is Cross River State. You know, so <laughs> they have very funny names for their for their body. I think sometimes only be totic erismeticine, something that you can't even find in dictionaries. <laughs> but that's not the thing. The story is that the size of the budget used to be over one trillion naira when that state has never generated IGR and FAC that is up to 100 billion. So the question hmm. is, what's the point of a budget that is unrealistic? I think this year now, they have reduced and moderated their budget size to over 300 billion, which in my view is still too high. Now, when you look at those budgets and you analyze them, you find that there's something there that we need to interrogate. And that thing is that when they overstate the size of the budget, which they know they cannot raise the money, it allows them to get away with scrutiny in terms of the recurrent expenditure. But because they will tell you that the capital component is 50% or 60%, and you say, well, this is very good. But they know mm. that all the revenue they can generate is barely 40% of that budget. So they end up spending most of the money on recurrent right. expenditure, and very little is left for capital, capital. development, for human capital, and for progress in terms of what we really need as a country. And that's why it was not surprising that we have 133 million people and that are multidimensionally poor. Because if you look at those indicators, there are things to do with, do we have access to education, clean water? No. Do we have uh, you know quality of life? Those no. things that we should be spending money on to lift our people out of poverty are really the things that are suffering eventually. Mm. Sincerely speaking, you've given an insight. And I want to state here, possibly the uh, Cross River decided to listen. I've, I've listened to you on several fora when you handle budget, uh, telling them that you give about $1 trillion when they cannot even generate up to $100 billion. And they decided this year that let's listen to what I will really say. <laughs> Reduce that thing and make it $300 billion. So no problem. I'm sure after this, they will look for a way to bring it down and be able to match up. Like I'm saying, I have your question. But before I go to the question of the uh, audience, you know, we are dealing with both the budget and the finance act. Uh, let me quickly ask you, uh, what is the current status of the uh, finance bill for 2022? And what are the key provisions on the bill? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the, because, uh, you know, I have to say that many people are confused about what's happening to the finance bill. Uh, so one thing I can say is that it wasn't signed today by the president because the president also has some reservations about some of the provisions introduced into the finance bill. And also the president said that there's, there's a need for more consultation with you know, the government agencies that may be impacted. I, I thought it was curious that the president didn't say there was a need to consult with the public. He was interested mm -hmm. in consulting with the government agencies because the people that will pay these taxes are not the government agencies. They are us. They are, they are businesses. They are private sector. They are individuals. And it was uh, disappointing for me that the Senate published the, a copy of the bill in the newspaper on the 21st of December and said that their public hearing was the following day, which was 22nd of December. You know, so just imagine the time to read that bill, to start making comments, to write your submission, send it to the National Assembly, book a flight if you're not in Abuja to go there. It was very clear to me that they didn't want people to come and say anything, right? They wanted to tick a box and say, yes, we did public hearing, even though nobody was there. <laughs> the House of Representatives published the finance bill also the same day, 21st of December, and said their public hearing will be 13th of yeah. January. We said, yeah. okay, at least House of Rep is doing better than the Senate. <laughs> Only for us to find out a few days later than the that the House of Rep has also passed the bill. So you pass the bill even before the public hearing, and then they harmonize and send to the president. So, uh, you know, I think we can do a lot better. It's not mm. a banana republic. This is democracy. And we should be getting better. We should not be getting worse. Uh, I remember those days where they would give us like two or three weeks. There's enough time for you to make your submissions. When you go for the public hearing, they would debate those issues. You know, it's important for us to improve our democracy and not to on the altar of expediency, of urgency, of wanting to pass it by a particular date, bypass the most important component 
you know, of the lawmaking process, which is really engaging with the people. So uh, the president, as we understand it now, is returning the finance bill back to the uh, National Assembly for them to make a few corrections, to engage with the government agencies, and hopefully maybe they will also engage with the rest of us uh, <laughs> before it becomes, uh, becomes a law. To be honest, there's nothing urgent about the finance bill, so it's better to delay it for a few more weeks, even if it's a couple of months, and get it right, than to urgently pass the law and then create more problems for society. Now, to the other part of your question in terms of, you know, what are the key provisions, key provisions yes, of the law? So uh, there are a few provisions introducing taxes, including, uh, you know, government wants to tax cryptocurrency. Um, I have my issues as to whether this is the right time, whether the framework is there <laughs> for them to even know who is investing in crypto because they said banks should not get involved. And mm. for the uh, exchanges where they help people trade in this currency, they are not regulating them. So how would you even know if I have crypto and I've sold without telling government? We also have a provision that government is seeking to impose a higher CIT of 50% on uh, gas flaring companies, that's what they call them. Uh, and bear in mind that some of these gas flaring company in quotes are upstream companies that are liable to tax under the Petroleum Industry Act and the PPTA, where they have to pay hydrocarbon tax up to 30%. They have to pay uh, CIT up to 30%. If you now increase it and add additional 20%, you would easily discourage those who are trying to invest in the gas sector. Because the much I know is that in those investments and oil producing assets where they flare gas, government is actually the senior shareholder, sometimes mm. holding about 60%. And they don't contribute their own investment for gas flare out or reduction of gas flaring. And then they will turn around and punish the private sector participants for the failure of government. So mm -hmm. if we don't reverse this, it's going to slow us down or actually we're going to lose out on the global drive for investment in gas, especially coming from Europe. In view of what has been happening in Ukraine uh, due to the Russian uh, invasion. So uh, that's one area where I'm hoping that as they are reviewing the finance bill, uh, they will reform that. Government also in the finance bill. Uh, they are taking away some of the incentives that we've known for some years, including investment allowance on plants and machinery, including rural investment allowance, uh, where they'll say if there's no electricity, if there's no road, if there's no, you know, they're taking that away. Uh, we also have uh, provisions to do with, you know, uh, EMT, that's the electronic, electronic money transfer. Money transfer. Yes, where government is saying that, you know, and the states are saying this money belongs to us. Uh, God, federal government will share 15% and give 85% to the state. As if, you know, it's not enough that the states are already angry. The federal government is now proposing that 35% will actually go to the local government. States will take 50% and federal government will keep 15%. My view is that this electronic money transfer is a disguised stamp duty. And stamp mm. duty, based on Section 163 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, belongs to states alone. It's not to be shared with federal, it's not to be shared with local government. Uh, so I think we should do everything in line with the Constitution, not to upset uh, other levels of government, and to ensure that we don't destroy the trust uh, between levels of government. Another mm. one is government is trying to impose excise duty on all services, uh, including telecommunication, um, at the rate to be prescribed by the president. Now, again, I'm concerned. I don't like the blanket excise duty on services. Uh, in a few countries where they have excise duty, it's usually on things like telecommunication, uh, things like gambling, right? So they don't put exercise on all services when you already have VAT that is on VAT. almost all services. So that's also another area of concern. Uh, government is also planning to import, impose the import levy, special import levy of 0.5% on any importation from outside Africa. Now, they want to be able to use the money to pay Nigeria subscription to all these international 
uh, organizations like the United Nations, like the AU. To be honest, I don't know of any other country where you have to impose a special levy so you can pay your subscription. Uh, but that's <laughs> what they decided to do. And the reality is, you know, for political narrative, it looks okay when you say, ah, anything from outside Africa, we impose tax on it like you are promoting Africa. But the reality is, go and look at the list of things we import. Where, where are they manufacturing man machinery and equipment in Africa? Mm. You know, mm. so it, most of the things we need, even for businesses, including manufacturers, are not available in Africa. They are available from outside Africa. So if you impose those additional taxes, it will increase the cost of doing business, and by extension, it would increase uh, inflation. The mm. other area is government is introducing anti-avoidance provision for VAT. So if you have VAT, if you have a transaction between related parties and government is doubtful of your price, they can adjust it upwards and ask you to pay an additional VAT, just like transfer pricing for VAT uh, is what they are trying to, to introduce. I think the other one I'll mention <clears throat> is um, the capital loss. You know, we currently have capital gains tax on things like shares, on assets like land and building. And if you make a gain, government will tax it. But if you make a loss, government will not allow you to deduct it. So one good thing about this finance bill is government now says, if you make a capital loss, you can deduct it against the same class of assets if you have a gain before you pay the tax. And you can carry it forward for up to five years if you are unable to claim your losses fully in any particular year. And for those who pay life assurance premium for their life and the life of their spouse, they will not be able to get tax deduction for it, uh, provided that they don't claim back the, the deferred annuity or the life premium or mm -hmm. so much done within five years. Uh, the interesting thing there is, you know, in the case of death, nobody plans for when they will die. If there's death, if death happens within five years of the insurance premium, I don't think that government should tax it. But in the case of the fad annuity, which is like a savings and investment scheme, now if you withdraw it within five years, I would understand because government does not want to create a loophole where people mm. can easily just use that to avoid. avoid uh, tax. I think I will stop there, you know, in the meantime. Uh, sincerely, sincerely speaking, you've given a deep insight into some of these key provision of the Finance Act 2020. And uh, I think the beauty of it, uh, I can tell you, Prof, uh, they seems to be listening to you in the spiritual. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, if the president has signed the Finance Act today, there will be, be a lot of uh, uh, confusion without having the stakeholders' engagement. And I think with this, that they are consulting with the FDAs, they might uh, give way for the private sector to have their own contributions and uh, see uh, the stuff that they can make out of it. So I'll go to our audience. Like I always tell you, they are fully prepared uh, to ask prof question because they know they will get response speedily. And I'm starting with our footballer at Dini, all the way from the Asian city in Ibado. He's asking, what are the components of ways and means now introduced to the budget and how sustainable is the inclusion of such in the budget of 2023 mm, very interesting question yeah so uh ways and means because i also see that even the lawmakers did not understand the ways and means so ways and means is the way we describe based on the law in nigeria when the central bank gives money to the federal government because federal government does not have money uh, normally, government should spend uh, revenue, which is from taxes and from natural resources like selling crude oil. That's what government should be spending. And when government does not have enough money to spend, government can borrow. Government will borrow by, you know, selling uh, bonds, you know, treasury bills. That's how government will normally finance their budget, especially when it's a deficit budget, which means the revenue we expect is not enough to cover the expenses. Now, when government cannot raise revenue and they are unable to borrow for whatever reason, they go to the central bank and say, central bank, please, can you give me money? That money that the central bank gives government can come from majorly two ways. One, you know when uh, you take money to the bank, the bank does not have access to the entire money that you have given to them because there's something called cash reserve ratio. 
The central bank will say for every 1,000 naira that you collect from customers, you must come and keep a percentage with me, compulsory and that amount you keep with them is with the central bank and you can't do anything with it. Now, the central bank can take that money and give it to the federal government to spend. That's one way of waste and means. Another way is central bank can just print it. They can just print money and give to government to go and spend. Now, this is what has added up to over 24 trillion naira, particularly under this uh, current uh, administration. That amount has ballooned. And it's so significant that it's part of the reason why inflation is going out of control because... On one hand, CBN is saying let's reduce money in circulation so that inflation will not get out of hand. On the same hand, that CBN is giving plenty of money to the federal government to go and spend. <laughs> so what they want to do now is, you know, federal government says on this ways and means, I'm having to pay central bank the monetary policy rate, which is now about 16.5%. So federal government says, National Assembly, can you help me? These ways and means, I want to go out, so the language is they want to securitize it, which means government wants to go and borrow money from the public and use the money to pay CBM back so that CBM. government will not be owing the public, right? And government wants to do that. They want to issue a 40-year bond at 9% interest rate. So they're saying that if National Assembly allows them to do it, they'll be paying only 9% instead of 16.5%. So I said this is a very interesting <laughs> argument, right? Because when you pay the interest to the CBN, who owns the CBN? It's not government. <laughs> you are paying yourself the interest. So I don't understand why that's supposed to be a problem. The real problem is that in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, there's a limit to how much you can ask the CBN to give you to spend. Mm -hmm. It is limited to, I think, 5% of your previous year's revenues. This government has collected far more than that percentage consistently. So uh, it's not good not to comply with provisions of the law. Uh, they can argue mm. that we are in an emergency situation, but to be honest, you know, the emergency has been there for so many years. It's now time for us to be able to plan properly. The lawmakers are saying they don't fully understand what it is and that they do not approve the spending. So I'm saying to the lawmakers, see, it's, that's not the spending itself, right? When you approve a budget that has a deficit, like now you just approve a budget that has deficit of over 10 trillion. 10 trillion. When they now go and borrow the money to go and spend, you cannot say you did not approve the spending, you approve the budget. What you can say is you did not approve the borrowing to come from the central bank. So I think we'll see how it plays out over the next few days, but I believe that the lawmakers have really no choice but to approve it so that that amount can be securitized. Mm, I'm sure five dollar and our other guests have actually picked uh, uh, something out of what Proverbs explained. And I have Dr. Abel uh, as saying all the way from Abuja. Uh, he said, in addition to the 2023 budget and supplementary of 2022 budget, the government spent over 22 trillion through ways and means, which the National Assembly did not approve. How do we get the government to embrace budget discipline? That's one. What value do we get as citizens for this reckless public sector spending? Hmm. Yeah. So I think you know maybe you know maybe my clarification would have helped a little bit, but I, I'm happy to clarify even further. So I agree that there's a need for budget discipline. Uh, spending discipline. In fact, from the budgeting process, sometimes we see a lot of padding, lawmakers will bring their own. You know, we have those issues that we need to deal with. But when the central bank gives money to their government to spend, there's nothing unusual about it. During the COVID period, uh, America, you know, <laughs> they got more than two trillion US dollars that they got from their central bank, which they call the Federal Reserve. And they shared, in fact, most of it, they sent money literally to people's, you know, they were sending them to individuals to go and spend since they were not working and they didn't want to get a, a period where people cannot take care of their needs. Uh, we saw that also in the UK, most countries printed money and spent. But the difference is that in most of those countries, the money that they printed, they give to poor people to spend so that they can survive. In Nigeria, poor people did not even get 
Uh, a few poor people that government claim that they gave the money to, most of us can't identify them. We don't know any of them. But even if they did, uh, those numbers were very small and insignificant compared to the amount of people who are poor, like 133 million people. So what I think we really need is to ensure that these ways, I mean, because if you are not careful, if you keep giving money from central bank to the federal government to spend, inf inflation will get out of hand. When this happened to Zimbabwe before Mugabe died, it got to a point when 100 trillion, and I'm going to repeat that, 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollars was not enough to buy a loaf of bread. People were carrying mm. money in a um, wheelbarrow. When they carry the money in wheelbarrow, the things they will buy will be less than the amount of the money they carry. <laughs> they so will drop the wheelbarrow there. <laughs> yes, we don't want to get to that point. So we have to put some discipline mm. into the budgeting process, into how we borrow, into how we spend, the amount we take from the CBN, and more importantly, there has to be 100 percent accountability and transparency so that we are all carried along in what government is doing. Uh, and I think that government needs to stop wanting to do everything. Like you want to do refinery, you want to do Air Nigeria. And we all know that government is terrible at running businesses. So allow those things that private sector can do, allow mm. private sector to do them and focus your limited resources on human capital development, good governance, and ensuring that the private sector is supported by the public sector to facilitate more growth and economic development. What a brilliant advice to the government supporting the private sector and giving good governance. Once we have that, I can like we shared before we started, no place like home. Once we have good governance, I'm sure people from diaspora will want to come in. Let me quickly go to Shuaib's question. And he's asking, do we have risk management running with government activity such that uncertainties that can affect implementation of objectives can be managed do we have such uh, i don't think we do because if we do it should be obvious to all of us i think government does not look at risk um in that sense which i think they should uh, i'm aware that there was a time the you know finance ministry were, were trying to put together a a, a fiscal risk framework uh, but we don't have something concrete for Nigeria because the risk that the country faces is different from the risk that individual or businesses face. For example, um, you don't really envisage that a government would go into bankruptcy because a government cannot be bankrupt. Worst case scenario, they print their money and spend it and we all get into problems and one day we get out of it. Now, if you think about the objective of this finance bill, as indicated by the government, they said they want to promote tax equity they want to address climate change they want to reform incentives they want to promote job creation and economic growth they want revenue generation and tax administration that's why the name of the frs is now being changed to nigerian revenue service and i do agree because if you look at it fedra presupposes that the frs only collect taxes for the federal government but that's not the case cit VAT, PPT, almost all the taxes collected by the FRS are shared by all three levels of government. So mm. FEDRA is not a good, you know, uh, word to put in their name. When you also say inland, inland presupposes that FRS can only collect revenue within Nigeria. Within. It should not be collecting international tax. And that's also not correct, right? Mm. So I, I agree that the name of the FRS should become Nigeria Revenue Service. But to your question again, those objectives that have been stated in the finance bill are all very good. You cannot disagree with any of them. But when it comes to the risk management framework and the strategy for achieving those objectives in the most optimal way so that you don't uh, cut your eye to spite your nose uh, or you don't take one step forward and take two backwards, take the one like the uh, climate change. Because Nigeria has committed to climate change, we are now saying let's impose additional tax on gas flaring when indeed we need all the investment we can get from gas at this particular point in time. So I think government can do better in terms of their strategy and risk management framework. 
Thank you very much, uh, Prof. So people that are just joining us, I've been guesting today, you know, I, I, I've been on the other climb. Guesting today, the man I call Professor Taiwoye Dele, who have been doing justice to our topic. Uh, you know, I, I think Prof gave me that power to call him Prof. Uh, because uh, you say, recognize me, Mister. But for me, you are prof mm. or prof. Uh, so, uh, before I come to first question on the the issue of uh, padding, uh, I have Peter Debayo bringing up a question to say, what is wrong with running a revenue-driven budget as against consistent expenditure-driven budget, perennial financing by humongous debt? Uh, uh, Peter Adebayo wants to have understanding of this. Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, the ideal situation is that you establish your revenue and then you figure out what is your priority of spending, right? Because there's no country that has enough money, not even the US. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so start with your revenue and then moderate your expenses to be within that. Whenever you exceed your revenue, it should be an exception, not the norm. It's something mm. that happens just because, like, when COVID came, nobody planned for COVID, you know, or when we had Boko Haram problems, and, you know, so it shouldn't be every year. So I do agree. Now, the problem we have with our revenue uh, is mostly, in my view, um, a leadership problem. So just imagine today that we are producing 2 million barrels per day. The, the money that we'll be making from oil revenue and the taxes from the oil sector will be more than we are making from the non-oil sector. Not only that, we'll be making so much from foreign exchange receipts that Naira will not be at 750 something in the parallel market. There was a year mm -hmm. when we made over $90 billion from foreign exchange receipts from selling crude oil alone, mm -hmm. right? Imagine we even have $90 billion for 2022, if fact, we can really just go back and say, well, we want to decide what rate we want dollar to be. Because mm -hmm. when you have that kind of money in dollars, you can determine your exchange rate by supplying the market enough FS liquidity. And if we did that, inflation will not be high as it is now because mm -hmm. a lot of our inflation is imported because we're importing things from other countries. So if we address oil thefts, and the other one is to address the wasteful petrol subsidy that is now around four to six trillion naira and it's unbelievable and mm. then the inefficiency in government where you find a lot of things are sometimes inflated they have projects that sometimes they cannot explain when you address all of those i'm so confident that even as of today nigeria has the capacity to generate sufficient revenue to meet our expenditure in a very productive manner without resorting every year to huge to budget deficit that seems to be getting out of control. Hmm. I'm sure Adebayo has picked uh, uh, to that. And uh, I need to recognize Fash, uh, who is asking uh, Prof, what is budget padding? Is it legal <laughs> to pad budget? If not, no. what is the way to put in the check? I'm sure he wants you to take us to class this evening. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you know, le legally speaking, there is no nothing called budget padding. So you won't find it in the constitution. It's not in any law in Nigeria. So I think it was one lawmaker that introduced that language, uh, Abdumumi Jibril. Yes, it was the one that introduced that language. But I think that language is a very perfect description of when you introduce all manner of things into the budget <laughs> beyond the original intention, right? I agree that it's not the role of the lawmaker to just collect the budget and stamp it. They're supposed to work on it. So which means they can increase, they can reduce. But when you are increasing for reasons that are not in the public interest, you reduce the amount for Lagos Ibadan Express Express <laughs> Road, and you go and put uh, empowerment to go and buy a sewing machine for your constituency. <laughs> it, that, that, that's padding because what you are doing is you are messing up the budget. And sometimes... You see an amount where 1,000 has been budgeted, and somebody will say, I think you need more than 1,000. They'll help you add 100 on top of it. But you know behind the scene, that 100 is to take care of boys and all of that. So that's boys what we job. have. Yes. So that is what we have come to know as budget padding in Nigeria. But legally speaking, there's no such technology uh, in our laws. 
It's not in our laws. And I think we give that credit to Abdulmuni Jubri, who mm. has given us a new vocabulary of Corp Project Party. Uh, before I go to my final question, uh, each time I guest prof on the program, I've asked my producer possibly to extend my timing on a day. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Taiwo Day is coming to like two hours so that I can do it just because there are a lot of questions behind the scene. But let me pick Oyegunle's question. He's saying, borrowing from international creditors to finance government budget deficit, what impact does it have on Nigeria economy? Yeah, yeah, very good question. It has a big impact. Now, because um, the Americans, the Federal Reserve, their own central bank, is increasing their interest rates. America is considered to be a low risk uh, government. So when they're increasing their interest rate, people will take money from other countries and go and give it to government of the US by buying their bonds. So when people are removing mon money from other countries, the currency of those other countries will devaluate. Uh, and that is why in 2020, uh, American US dollar uh, appreciated by almost 20% against global currencies. Now, what that means is, before Nigeria could issue euro bond, that's borrowing from foreign markets in dollars at even 8%. Nobody wants to give Nigeria 8% anymore. They are now asking for 12, 13%. This is in dollars though. So when you have to pay 30% in dollar terms and your Naira to dollar is 780 something, you know that's a no-go area. So that was why last year, Federal government said they wanted to do euro bond. When they saw the rate, you know, we can call it the yield. They ran back and said, we are not doing it again. You know, so when you borrow foreign currency, the, your risk is twice as high as when you borrow local currency because you don't have the dollars and you can't print it. And you had, that's what happened to Ghana. So Ghana could no longer service their foreign debt. They could not earn enough foreign currency to meet their need for importation and, you know, you don't want to imagine what has happened to Ghana. They got to a point where their currency was the worst performing against the U.S. dollar in the whole world. Hmm. Uh, and now they're having to ration and do a lot of things. But really, that's the simple answer to that question. Hmm. And uh, like I said, the time is always just uh, challenging. But I want to take this question because it's critical to us as professionals. And that is... What is your outlook of 2023 and the areas of opportunities for professional accountants? You know, <laughs> this, this is our field. And I'm sure as someone who is well versed, you have certain areas to unleash for our members to tap into as we wind up. Sir. Mm, yeah, you know, very good one. I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, my advice to government in terms of the finance bill is that we need to respond to the issues that are most important to our people. We should prioritize that. Take, for example, foreign exchange. Um, government today, in many of our laws, they still require that companies pay any tax based on transaction in whatever currency, in that same currency. So if you are buying a software uh, from Google or from Facebook or from you know, uh, Apple, and you find you go and bid for one thousand dollars to go and pay. When you finish paying, you say, "Ah, there is VAT, reverse charge. There is withholding tax." You now go again to the market to go and bid for dollar that is already in Nigeria to go and pay government of Nigeria, creating artificial demand and depreciating naira in the process. Uh, government should amend the law to say any tax that is due in Nigeria, go and pay it in naira. Russia did that, and they're currently even appreciated now because they were, it was time to pay taxes. And Russia said, pay me all my taxes in my local currency. People local have to currency. bring their dollars to sell it to demand for, you know, we need to do that. And then there's a Japa problem. People are leaving Nigeria, but we can also provide opportunity for our people to sit down here and work for global organization. But the tax rules are coming in the way of that because those foreign employers are afraid of creating permanent establishment in Nigeria. We need to amend the law to allow people to take advantage of those global opportunities. And that leads me to your other part of your question about what's the outlook, what should professional accountants you know, prepare for? I think the outlook is that 2023 will be a tough year based on all predictions, including that of the IMF, uh, where they said about one third of the world's economy will go into recession. And that for countries that will not go into recession, it will feel like recession. I think Nigeria will be one of the countries that will not go into recession. 
but it will feel like a recession. So it will be, it will be a tough year. Uh, we also have an added issue in Nigeria that is a transition year. So I call it the year of two halves. The first half of the year is when you are, you know, trying to hand over. The second half is where you are trying to settle down into a new government. And, you know, I don't think anything will change in the way this government is running Nigeria in the first half. That second half now depends on who wins the election and emerge as the next CEO for, for Nigeria. Professionals should be, they need to ensure that they are following this development. And number one, acquire the knowledge. If you have the knowledge, remain very current and follow what's going on. That will help you to be able to identify opportunities. I only really like to say that when the economy is doing well, you have opportunities. When the economy is struggling, you have even more opportunities, especially as professionals, because you need to understand it and more people need your help. The organizations you work for, uh, the opportunities if you are in practice to help your clients and even to help governments. Uh, and also, uh, I also like to say that even in our own personal finances, there are people who don't know what kind of investment they need to make because they don't understand what risk will be in the bond market, in the money market broadly, in the equity market, cryptocurrency. I'll say as professionals, you already have been trained and you have better skills than the average individual. Develop that skill further. Find something to learn online. You know, what are, you know, metaverse, how does that affect you? NFTs, what's happening across Africa? What's happening to the rest of the world? You find that, that overall, you will not be able to control everything, but you have sufficient knowledge to be able to do well now and to be able to thrive in the medium to long term, both personally for your household and then for the organizations that you work for. So I really encourage uh, our fellow professional colleagues uh, to take this on board very seriously. Uh, I say now the biggest university is in your hand and that's your mobile phone. And you can assess almost anything that you want. And any skill can be learned and you can almost become an expert within six months if you are dedicated to it with proper discipline. Hmm. And that is a brilliant way to come to the end of the show today. I've been guesting Professor Taiwo Yedele, FCA, who has been doing justice to the analysis of the 2023 budget and the finance bill for 2023. Uh, you have given, in fact, the last word actually broke the cameras back by saying the mobile phone in our hand is the world's largest university. We can learn there. We can get so much training and become as near expert as expected of us. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to you that out of your tight schedule, you have decided to share with us wealth of knowledge with our, 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 our audience this evening. The first episode of the Icon on Air for the year 2023. Uh, I'm sure all the time that I will call Prof, he will always be there to give insight into some of the things. And that uh, we can always say that God will increase uh, your wisdom in all ramifications. On that note, we have come to the end of the program for today. When I'll be coming back again on Thursday, uh, the fifth day of the month of January 2023, one thing I can assure you, that there is enough package for 2023. If you are here enjoying ICANN on air alone, uh, don't be selfish. Get someone to come and tap from the knowledge of the erudite scholars that will be bringing your way every Tuesday and Thursday. It's just an hour, and there is nothing that you can lose but gain more and more by being part of this. On that note, I want to say special thank you to the 58th president of our great institute, the editorial board for always been there, putting this together, the technical team. Uh, until I come your way next uh, on Thursday, the fifth day of the month of January, I remain your host, Olusheson Okwadi, FCA. Till then, stay safe and make use of your phone as your new university to learn on every day. Till then, bye for now. <laughs>